Sunday morning, and I don't know about you guys, but I am so excited uh, today for the opportunity to preach God's word, just excited about Jesus. Uh, a few days ago, we were um, celebrating Good Friday, and it's only good because Easter Sunday morning is, uh, is, is coming, and so today is Resurrection Sunday morning, and there's a word from the Lord. Before we open up God's word together today, let's spend a moment in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we want to say thank you today for life. We thank you, God, for health and strength. 
We thank you, God, for this opportunity for us to be able to connect virtually today. We thank you, God, that you're speaking to your people even now. We celebrate Jesus today. We thank you, God, for his life. We thank you for his ministry, for his preaching. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the miracles and signs and wonders that he performed as he walked this earth. We thank you that uh, Christ is truly man and truly God. We thank you for uh, Good Friday, that day that he laid down his life for his people. And we thank you, God, for this Resurrection Sunday morning. Thank you that he is no longer in the tomb. He's risen as he said he would. We give you praise today, glory and honor, and it's in the matchless name of Jesus that we pray, and all of God's people said amen, amen, and amen. Well, this morning I want to call your attention to the gospel of Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to begin reading there at verse number one on today. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and in your Bibles you'll find similar words. It says, now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know who you seek, Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, I've told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and, and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to come to Galilee, and there they will see me. Amen. The word of God is blessed. I want to leave there as a uh, subject for us to think about on today, the most important piece, the most important piece. And of course, we're talking today about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want to submit to you this morning that the resurrection, when we think about all that Christ came to accomplish, uh, that none of it really means anything without the reality of the resurrection. In fact, it's Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 15, who uh, goes through this discourse saying that, listen, if the resurrection didn't happen, if Christ is not risen, then everything we do is absolutely positively in vain. He says our preaching is in vain. Our teaching is in vain. Our faith is, is in vain. And he says, and you of all men are most pitiful if Christ is not risen from the dead. And so this is the most important piece. What do you mean, John, it's the most important piece? Well, I want to illustrate it like this. Uh, a couple days ago, our, our family bought a puzzle. Uh, we've got a 550 piece puzzle. And, and so we put it all, all the pieces on the table and we begin to uh, piece together uh, those, those parts that look alike. And we, we discovered that it would be easier to find the corner pieces and uh, to assemble the corner and then uh, begin to fill it in uh, in the middle. And we're still working on this puzzle. We got about another two days or so to go. But watch this. We could put together 549 pieces of that puzzle. But if we're missing one piece from the center, then the puzzle is incomplete. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is as if everything we believe, everything we preach, everything we trust, everything is incomplete without the reality of the resurrection. Yes, we thank God for Good Friday. For on Good Friday, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, took upon himself the sin of the world. One writer put it this way, the worst about us was laid upon him, and then the best about him was laid upon us. For he who knew no sin, was made to be a sin offering for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's Good Friday, but here's the good news. Early Sunday morning, I wish I had a church. He got up with all power in his hand. 
Before the sun rose, the sun rose. Somebody will catch that later on. Before the S-U-N rose, the S-O-N rose. This is the peace that matters the most. The gospel would be incomplete without the resurrection. Let's walk through the verses before us today. It says in verse number one, now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And so this is the first day of the week. This is not the last day of the week, which is the Sabbath. This is the first day of the week. It's Sunday morning. This is the day that uh, ever since the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the church, God's people, have gathered to meet on the Lord's Day, on Sunday. This is the first day of the week. And the Bible says Mary Magdalene. This is a woman who loved much because she had been forgiven much. Jesus had delivered her from a multiplicity of demonic spirits and, 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 and changed her life forever. I'm preaching to two or three people this morning who, who met Jesus and your life was a mess and he changed your life forever. And so Mary Magdalene, and it says the other Mary, went to see the tomb. One of the things that I want to point out before I give you the first point is just the sincerity of these women. Okay, these are the last people at the cross. These are the women who saw the body of Christ come down from the cross. They saw him buried in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And so these women know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this man had died. They saw him placed in the tomb. They're not going to the tomb expecting to see a miracle. They're going to say their goodbyes and to anoint his body for burial. This is one of the reasons that we know that we can trust the account, the gospel account of the resurrection of Christ. These women were not going to see him risen. They were going to say goodbye. It says in verses two through four, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. I just want you to notice how God, through this passage of scripture, wields his strength and wields his power. How God throws his weight around. It says that an angel of the Lord descended and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Here's the first point I want to leave with us on today. The resurrection empowers the weak. The resurrection empowers the weak. In fact, I would submit to you today that the resurrection of Christ is the greatest demonstration of the power of God to have ever been displayed. And I'm talking about the God who created the heavens and the earth. I'm talking about the God, amen, who makes green grass grow, who put the moo and the cow and the meow and the cat. I'm talking about God who does those things that are exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. But the greatest thing that he's ever done is this miracle of the resurrection. But here's the thing. Nobody saw the resurrection. And by the time we get to the text before us today, the resurrection has already taken place. And yet we see the power of God demonstrated in the text. And I want you to see the power of God over and above the worst that the enemies of Christ could do. Think about it for a moment. When, when we go from Good Friday up to Resurrection Sunday, you see the worst that the enemies of Christ could do to Jesus. The first thing we see is the suffering inflicted on the cross. The Bible says, amen, that he suffered, that he bled, and that he died. That he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, that the chastisement that would lead to our peace was upon him and by his stripes we were healed. And so this suffering that he inflicted, that was inflicted on him at the cross was the worst that his enemies could possibly do to him. But then secondly, we see the stone that Joseph of Arimathea, we see in chapter 27, verse 60, that he rolls in front of the tomb. Matthew Henry said it this way. He said, a great stone was rolled to the door of the sepulcher, signifying that those who are dead are separated and cut off from the living. If the grave were his prison, now the prison door locked and bolted. The rolling of the stone to the grave's mouth was with them 
as filling up the grave with dirt is to us. It completed the funeral. You, you see, this is the worst that they could do was to inflict suffering upon him and then to put him in a tomb and roll the stone in front of the tomb. But then we see a third thing here. There's a seal on the tomb. There are ropes in front of the stone and wax placed on those ropes and the seal of Pilate signifying his authority is placed on the tomb. And then we see a fourth thing here. We see the soldiers in chapter 27, verses 65 and 66, who represented not the authority of Pilate per se, but the power of Pilate to enforce the authority of Pilate. Now, here's the point that I want to make this morning. The very worst that the enemies of Christ could do was in the suffering, was in the stone, was in the seal, and was in the soldiers. But the Bible says there's a great earthquake. And an angel appeared who looked like lightning. Don't miss that. Watch God wield his power around. A great earthquake. And then an angel who looked like lightning and whose clothing was white as snow came and moved the stone away so that by the time we get to the text, watch the power of God. The women were going to the, to, to the tomb to say their goodbyes. And in one gospel writer's account, one of the women asked the other, how in, how in the world are we going to move the stone? But watch the power of God. By the time they made it to the tomb, the stone had been moved by the strength of God. The seal had been broken by an authority greater than power. The soldiers who had been guarding the body of a dead man, the Bible says, verse 4, that they trembled and they became like dead men. But here's the shout. The shout is that these were all the lesser of the miracles. The greatest miracle to ever happen was that on Easter Sunday morning, before the sun rose, the sun, capital S-O-N, rose. Look at verses 5 through 7. Verse number five says, but the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has risen as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. Here's the second point this morning. The resurrection of Jesus Christ comforts the distress. The resurrection comforts the distress. What's interesting about the text is that this same angel of the Lord who caused the soldiers of Pilate to tremble in fear and to appear as though they were dead men brought great comfort and consolation to these women at the tomb. I want you to notice five phrases, and I'll give this to you as quickly as I possibly can. The angel speaks to the women and he comforts them. He says, first of all, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. In other words, stop being scared. You, you were afraid when you came here. You saw the circumstances. You saw the worst that men with their evil hands could inflict upon Jesus Christ. And you've come to the tomb and you're already nervous. And now you've seen this miraculous sight, these angels, and now you're afraid. Stop being afraid. That's a word of comfort. But then secondly, the angel says, I, says, I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. That's a word of compassion. In, in other words, uh, you, you saw him when he died and, and you saw him when he was put into the tomb. And, and I, I understand how hopeless you are. I understand how discouraged you are. And I know what you came here for. He was crucified and you're looking for him. This is a word of compassion. But then they say uh, the angel says he's not here for he has risen as he said. And that's a word of completion. In other words, I want you to remember what Jesus has said throughout his ministry. He always said that he would rise again. Do you remember? It's a word of completion. If we were to trace uh, the footsteps of Jesus just through Matthew's gospel, Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 21 to his disciples, I'm going to be raised on the third day. He says to them in Matthew 17 and 9, I will be raised from the dead. In 17 and 23, I'll be raised on the third day. 
He says to his disciples in Matthew 20 and 19 that I'll be raised on the third day. And then watch this in chapter 26, verse 32. He says, after I'm raised, I will go before you to Galilee because I want to meet you there. He's not here. He's risen just as he said. Let me just give this to you as a sidebar. When the text says he is risen, that is uh, passive. And so the more accurate translations say that he has been raised. In other words, Jesus didn't raise himself from the dead. The father who was pleased with his sacrifice raised his son up, amen, from the grave with all power in his hand. And then the angels say, fourthly, come see the place where he lay. And that's a word of consolation. He's not in there. Go take a look. Go, go check it out. Go peep game. God did what God said that God would do. And then finally, there's a word of commissioning. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen. That's a word of commissioning. And I move into my next point after I share this with you. The angel's charge to these women is the same charge that God gives to every child of God under the sound of my voice, God says to us, come and see and then go and tell. Come and see the evidence. Come and see the word fulfilled. Come, come, come and see Christ. Come and experience him. Come, 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 come and look. Come to church, yes, but, but, but don't look too long. I've called you to examine the evidence so that you might leave and go and tell somebody else that Christ has risen from the grave. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but God has commissioned you to come and see and then go and tell. Some of us are too comfortable coming and seeing and coming and looking and, and we get uh, spiritually obese. And, and we've got all of this word and all of this doctrine and all of this understanding and we have yet to leave the holy house of God or leave the place of dead things and go and tell somebody else. Come and see and then go and tell. Verses 8 through 10 so they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers. There it is again. Come and see. Go and tell. Tell my brothers to go to Galilee, he says, and there they will see me. The final point this morning is that Resurrection Sunday, the resurrection is about embracing the undeserving. The resurrection is about embracing the undeserving. I want to uh, just uh, point something out. You may have noticed this uh, as we read through the scriptures, but, but I want you to see this. Now, now it's as the women obey that they experience something that transformed their lives. You, you see, we often want God to bless us. We often want uh, God to speak to us. We often want God to give us understanding and we're waiting on understanding and we're waiting on blessing and we're waiting on clarity before we obey him. But it's very interesting to me that as these women obey the word of the angel of the Lord and as they're on the way to tell the disciples that Jesus is going before them to Galilee, the Bible says that it's on the way that Jesus meets them on the road and says greetings. He says greetings. And that's interesting to me as I study that word, the word here in the Greek is Cairo. And it comes from the same Greek word as grace. Grace is charis. In Greek, and joy in the Greek is kara, and rejoice is karomai. And so, so here's the point. He says more to them than hello. It, it's more to it than just greetings. What, what Jesus does is he gives them the warmest well wishes. It's as if I saw you on the street, and I knew that something was going wrong with you, and I would look at you and say, are you good? You good. See, see, one is a question and then the other is an affirmation. It's as if I, I can see, amen, that there's something that, that may be wrong, but I'm encouraging you at, at the same time that you're okay. 
I don't know who needs to hear this today, but when life is confusing, when you're struggling to understand what God is doing in the world or what God is doing in your life, Jesus will meet you on the road of obedience. Some of us are miserable. Some of us are mean. Some of us are mad. Some of us are malicious because of the decisions we've made to do our own thing. But who am I speaking to when I tell you today that Christ will meet you on the road of obedience? The Bible says when he does, these women took hold of his feet. This is another reason we believe in uh, the literal, physical, bodily resurrection of Christ. They were not grasping a hold of a ghost. He, he was risen in a visible, physical body. They grabbed his feet and the Bible says that they worshiped him. Listen, friends, if you don't do anything else this Resurrection Sunday morning, I encourage you to take some time to worship the Lord. Take some time to consider the truths of the word of God concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, concerning his, his miraculous birth, concerning his sinless life, concerning his effective ministry, concerning uh, his great passion and his substitutionary death on your behalf and mine. Take some time to consider the truth, to come and see, and then to worship him. Last thing I want you to see is grace in the text. This is how God embraces undeserving people. Look at verse number 10. It says the angel of the Lord in verse, uh, verse number five, the angel of the Lord tells the women, go and tell the disciples. I want you to notice here how Jesus flips the script. Jesus slightly changes the message and the slight change of the message is all that really matters. It makes all the difference. Jesus changes the message. He does not say, go and tell my disciples. He says, go and tell my brothers. Somebody should have shouted right there. You, you, you got to understand these are these are the men who had turned and denied him when he needed them the most. These are men who deserted him. The Bible teaches us that only one disciple that is John, the beloved disciple. Only one man went all the way to the cross with him. The rest of, of them denied him and deserted him. The, the rest of them were cowards. They ran away. The rest of them were anything but a child of God. But the word teaches us today that Christ, after the resurrection, treats us much better than we deserve. Who am I preaching to today? You've denied Christ at times. You've deserted Christ at times. I've deserted Christ at times. I've denied him at times. But Christ was crucified to absorb the wrath of the Father toward the sin of his elect. And that sin, past, present, and future. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other found I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm so glad he died for my sin. So that he could embrace me with my undeserving self. My unsatisfied self. My, my, my unkept self. He died so that I could live. He was hung up for my hangups. Buried him in a borrowed tomb. Stay there all night Friday. Stay there all day Saturday. All night Saturday night. But early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. I said all power in his hand. And I'm so glad that he did. Last year, October, in the beginning of November, I joined a group of brothers in the ministry and sisters in the ministry on a pilgrimage to Israel. And at the climax of that, at that, that time in Israel, we went to Jerusalem. The very last stop was at the garden tomb. It was the place that they said that Jesus was buried and risen from the grave. And we stood in line there and we waited our turn to walk into the tomb so that we could see the place that they said he was buried. And I made my way and I ducked down, walked through that small door and, and went on the inside. And something in, in, inside of me leapt 
Because as I looked around, he was gone. <laughs> he was not there. He is risen as he said he would. And that is the peace. That is the peace that's most important. Thank God that he died. Thank God that he lived the perfect life. Because that is absolutely essential to the gospel. Essential to who I am. But had he not risen on the third day with all power in his hand. Paul says, listen, your preaching would be in vain. Your faith would be in vain. Our life groups would be in vain. Zoom meetings, prayer calls on Saturday morning, the church desiring to come back together again in, 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 in the physical temple so that we can fellowship and engage in discipleship. Paul says all of that would be in vain if all of the pieces of the puzzle were together, but that one piece of the resurrection of Jesus Christ were not there. Thank God that he's risen. Father, we thank you so much for your word, for what eyes have seen and ears have heard on today. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his life. And we thank you for his death. But we celebrate today his victorious resurrection. Thank you for all that his resurrection means to us. God, we thank you today that because he died, was buried, and was raised, that we've been crucified with him. And it's no longer us who live, but, but Christ who lives in us. And the, and the life that we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us. Thank you, God, for every precious promise in your word. We thank you that the resurrection of Christ is the reality that Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So that those who die in Christ, we are assured a resurrection of our own, that we will have a physical body, that we will live for all eternity. And thank you, God, that we'll live all eternity in the presence of our precious victorious Savior. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.